Hello, I'm Annette Young, the host of 51 Cent. As war continues in Ukraine in a special edition, we're focusing this week on its impact on women. With hundreds of thousands fleeing the conflict, it's also putting women and girls at heightened risk of violence. We'll be talking to those who stayed behind, some joining the fight itself, and those from afar who are now watching in horror as their country transforms into a battlefield. The 51% presented by Annette Young on France 24 and France24.com. Consider me your code breaker. Day after day, I'm ready to go on air at any moment to help you make sense of the news we report. I'm here to go live on set with analysis of the most important events of the day, often as they occur, and to provide clarity to our viewers. At France 24, I work closely with the duty editor to give perspective to the big international news stories of the day. My job is to follow international news and current affairs on a daily basis, to better understand and analyse the historical, geopolitical, economic and environmental importance of the world's major news stories. On France 24, in-depth analysis of all the news from our international affairs editors. Liberté, égalité, actualité. Russia is accused of violating temporary ceasefires that were agreed in two Ukrainian cities, including the strategic port of Mariupol. Officials say the city is being shelled, as is a humanitarian corridor meant for civilian evacuations. Fighting raging elsewhere, Ukraine's president slams the West for its continued refusal to enforce a no-fly zone over his country, saying, quote, all the people who die will die because of you. And the crisis looming large over next month's presidential election in France. As Emmanuel Macron released his first campaign video, we take a look at the challenges of holding a vote as war has returned to Europe. On day 10 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there had been some hopes of a let up, but that was dashed after a matter of hours. Ukrainian officials accused Russia of violating temporary ceasefires in the strategic port city of Mariupol and the smaller city. This break in fighting was meant to allow civilians to evacuate via humanitarian corridors. That has been put on hold. Some reports saying the routes are being attacked by Russian forces. The Ukrainian officials had already warned of a looming catastrophe in Mariupol, where half a million people live, and there's no, no electricity, no water, and no heat, and it's impossible to bring in medical supplies and aid. For more, let's speak to military consultant Guillaume Lasconjarias. Hello, Guillaume. Um, you know, we've heard conflicting reports about the, about the ceasefire being violated. If it is true that Russia was indeed shelling Mariupol, does that surprise you? Well, thanks for having me. It's always difficult to explain what's uh, going on uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation where uh, fights are still raging. Uh, the first thing that we can observe is that Mariupol has been uh, a strategic objective for Russia. It is still important because it's uh, the city that connects literally the Donbass front to uh, the one uh, emerging from Crimea. And therefore, you can understand why it's so important for the Russian to take uh, control uh, of Mariupol. Uh, second, of course, uh, establishing a humanitarian corridor is uh, an obligation. It's mandatory uh, by, the, by the humanitarian laws. Um, and uh, it means actually to uh, make the, the civilian exit from, from the city, bring in uh, medical supplies, uh, some food, some, some critical uh, needs uh, that, that uh, the, the people uh, also uh, have, have in need. Nevertheless, those who will not be able to evacuate would then be considered uh, maybe as uh, soldiers. And, uh, and that's the, uh, the, the difficulty there. If uh, those that cannot evacuate uh, are uh, still considered as 
possible uh, objectives. It means that the shelling, the destructions, the rebels uh, of Mariupol will, uh, and, and the suffering of the, of the city and its people will increase. And why is Mariupol uh, so strategic and so, um, so interesting in Vladimir Putin's eyes? Well, uh, for three reasons. The first thing is that, again, uh, it, it links or it connects uh, the, the, the two fronts and it allows Russia to gain control of the coastline and seal, literally, the, the Sea of Azov. The second reason is uh, Mariupol is a, a, a city where you have a lot of metallurgy and industries, uh, and by taking it, you would have uh, something that would deprive Ukraine of uh, some of its uh, key resources. And third, if you enter uh, a stage of further negotiation, you need to have some bargaining chip. And of course, uh, possessing cities uh, has, has a lot of meaning. Uh, Ukraine's president had earlier said uh, after the NATO summit refused to impose a no-fly zone. He said that, quote, all the people who die will die because of you. We've since had reaction from Vladimir Putin, who said any country that w were to impose the no-fly zone would be a parties to the conflict. Why is this issue of no-fly zone so sensitive? Well, uh, to, to be very clear, uh, a no-fly zone is uh, something that means actually to be defensive uh, in uh, principle, yet in nature it is also aggressive. Uh, what I do mean is that when you want to enforce a no-fly zone, uh, you literally put your air forces, your combat patrols, your aircraft uh, in uh, and over an area where they will probably encounter um, fight and maybe be shot down or actually destroy enemy aircraft. So in this case, yes, uh, you are at the risk of escalating the conflict. Therefore, when uh, NATO Secretary General and the NATO uh, as an organization, um, what they did recall yesterday uh, at uh, this, uh, and, and this summit was to actually establish the principle that NATO still defends the Allies, yet is not willing to uh, establish a no-fly zone over uh, Ukraine because that would literally uh, rise the risk of uh, entering uh, the conflict, something that nobody wants. All right. Thank you very much, Kim. Guillaume Lesconjarius, military consultant, speaking to us about some of the latest developments on the ground. Meanwhile, we can check in on the capital of Kyiv. There continues to be fierce fighting, Ukrainian forces battling to keep the Russians from encircling the city. The vast armed convoy approaching the capital from the north still seems to be largely stalled. Clovis Kasali and Robert Parsons have more. Beyond the outskirts of Kyiv, roadblocks everywhere. Even deep in the countryside, local farmers stand guard with nothing but their hunting rifles. Many civilians are fleeing the capital, but Ukrainian troops are moving to strengthen their front. A brief stop to fill up with petrol before heading off to reconnoiter Russian positions. The Russians thought it would be easy, like when they seized Crimea. They could occupy our Ukrainian soil without firing a shot. But that's not how it's working out. I'd like to tell the Russian soldiers, come here, guys, and you'll see what kind of a reception you'll get. Thirty kilometers outside Kiev, where Russian tanks have yet to reach, Sergei is spending the night in a hotel. He's decided to return to Kiev despite the bombardment. Not easy to explain his decision to his parents. Why Putin do this? Why he made all mothers of Ukraine cry? We have a conversation today with her, and she understand me that I want to stay there because so much people go away. And she told me that um, some people must stay and defend the uh, city. Sergei is an engineer but focus now on helping the defense as best he can. In my opinion, um, I haven't tried to kill another man. But if it will be need in future, if Russians really comes uh, and take Kyiv, 
I don't know what I can to do. We are another nation, we are another people in our mind, in our soul. Don't touch us, please. Up at the crack of dawn to go back to Kiev. He and his friends plan to take food and medicines to the frontline troops. My friend who must take me from this place not answered on the, my call. I don't know what can happen with, with him. Maybe he is dead because he is from uh, territorial defense of this city. Everything can happen. I will go by my legs to here. He leaves alone, trying to hitch a lift back to a city under siege. Like so many Ukrainian civilians who have been thrust into this war, he's ready to pay any price to defend his country. More than 1.2 million people have flooded into neighboring countries, roughly 145,000 to Hungary, an additional 100,000 in Moldova, and more than 90,000 in Slovakia. But 650,000, the vast majority, going to Poland. And that is where the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, was earlier pledging to offer more assistance from the White House. The Biden administration just requested to Congress 2.5, uh, excuse me, 2.75 billion dollars in humanitarian assistance. Uh, that's both to meet the need of vulnerable people and communities inside Ukraine, uh, as well as to support refugee services, including here in Poland. That's in addition to the more than 54 million dollars in humanitarian assistance to Ukraine that we announced uh, just last week. And earlier, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky issued a statement to the refugees, one of comprehending why they left their country, but also a message of hope that soon, one day, they could return to their homeland. I'm sure we'll soon be able to say, come back, come back from Poland, Romania, Slovakia and other countries. You can come back because there's no longer a threat. We're thinking about a future for Ukrainians at the end of the war, how to revive our cities and our economies. The UN Security Council will hold an emergency meeting Monday on the humanitarian crisis and discuss a possible draft resolution. On Friday, the council met for an emergency session. There was an international condemnation of Russia after an assault on the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Kami Nedelec has more. The Russian attack on a nuclear power plant in Ukraine put the entire European continent at risk, the U.S. said at the U.N. Security Council. The United Nations had called the emergency meeting in response to shelling at the plant. Russia's attack last night put Europe's largest nuclear power at grave risk. It was incredibly reckless and dangerous. The unprecedented attack on a fully functioning nuclear power plant is against international law and the Geneva Convention, which is designed to protect civilians from the crossfire of war. Russia dismissed the accusations as false. Today's meeting is one more attempt by the authorities in Kyiv to rekindle the artificial hysteria about what is happening in Ukraine, and they are encouraged